and we're just going to jump right in. I know I introduced myself last night to most of you, but for the few of you who are here for the first time, uh, I'm from Southern California. I actually live right between Los Angeles and San Diego, but I worked in Los Angeles County for a number of years just working homicides, and I was working cold cases specifically. Now, cold cases are uh, unsolved murders. There are no cold cases of any other kind of crime. The reason why is because there's a statute of limitation on every other crime. Robberies and burglaries and other crimes have a statute of limitation. If I can't solve it in five or six or seven or eight years, it's going to close. And I cannot solve it because the statute has expired. But murders are not like that. Murders stay open forever. There is no statute of limitations for a murder. So I can go back and work those. And my cases have been from about 1972 to about 1988, the range of, of murders that I first started working. And if you like Dateline, the last case was on Monday night. That was a case from 1988. Now, what we're doing here is t taking a similar approach. It's from a book I wrote called uh, God's Crime Scene, where we're going to look at the universe using the same skills we do as a detective. We talked about that last night. If you remember, we used this model of inside or outside the room. Because what we do is we look at crime scenes or death scenes and we ask the question, can I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room? If I can, it's not a murder. But if I have to go outside the room for an explanation, that means I've got an intruder and I've got to consider the possibility of a murder. And we said, could we do the same thing with the universe? Could we have a, a, a model in which we look at the universe and we ask the question, can I explain all the stuff that's in this room? The natural realm of the universe. Can I explain it by staying in the room? If I can, I can only use space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry for every explanation. And these eight things have to be explained. They're in the room. How do I explain them? And last night we talked about this one, the beginning of the universe. Now, tonight, we're going to, today, we're going to talk about the second piece of this. These two are cosmological, these two are biological, these two are mental, and these two are moral. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the second one of these today. We'll have covered all the cosmological evidence, and then in my breakout session, I'm going to cover these two. Okay? We're not going to cover these, though, but you've already started talking about it. Last night, Dennis was talking about soul, or at least mind, and that's something you guys have kind of already covered. Now, we use this model of saying, hey, if I made a list of all the evidences in the room, and then I made a list of all the explanations, all I have to figure out is which of these explanations best fits the evidence. In a similar way, if the room is the universe, we have to make a list of all the evidence in the universe and then ask the question, which of these two explanations will actually explain the uh, evidence best? And now we're going to talk about a universe that appears to be designed. A number of years ago, I had a case where uh, a husband had killed his wife and his child, his daughter, uh, by asphyxiation. Did I say that right? Why is that a hard word for me? What he did was he basically gassed them to death in their own home. And in the morning that they were discovered, her, his mother-in-law the victim's mother, came over to visit her daughter. And when she got to the house, she saw that there were some conditions at the house that were suspicious. And looking back at it, as an investigator, when I arrived there, I saw the same thing that she saw. There were several layers of suspicious conditions. When she got to the house, look, there's a backstory here. This guy had been having problems with his wife and had been having financial problems and relational problems, and you could kind of see this murder coming. So there's a story, a backstory, involving his relationship with his wife that was unique to him. And when she got there, he had not been paying his bills here. He had not been paying the mortgage. He had not been paying the utility bills. And the gas had been turned off at the house. But he had just recently, like the day before, paid to have the gas turned back on. That's unusual, right? The only utility that he paid to have turned back on was the gas. So that was an unusual backstory. When the mom arrived, she saw that her daughter's car was still in the driveway where it really wasn't supposed to be at the time. Usually she's gone, but or usually it's parked in the garage. And when she walked around the back of the house, she discovered that the back window that was, she, the door was locked. 
She couldn't get in, and she knocked on the door, nobody answered. So she went around the back of the house, and the back door was often unlocked, but sometimes it was open. She thought she might be getting the back, back door. And, and what she saw was that one of the windows that was kind of always frozen in a half-open position, it's a very safe neighborhood usually, no one, who cares? It's, it's always warm, so I leave the window open, we're in Southern California. But this window had been forced closed. So the window was closed, and that surprised her, because she's like, that window's always open. So they had some, another layer that was actually closer to that. In addition to the backstory of this relationship, there were some conditions of the house that were suspicious to her. And when we finally got in, we discovered that inside the house, there were a number of other interesting conditions. There was a door at the bottom of the stairs that was almost always open. It was just a door to the stairwell. It was closed. Upstairs, there was a bedroom door closed, and there was a, a pile of clothing. There was a wall heater that heated the hallway on one side of the wall here and heated the master bedroom on the other side, old house. And somebody had stacked clothes up on the hall side, and the pilot light was out, but the gas was full on inside the bedroom. And some of the clothes were actually on the floor. When the door was closed, they were on the floor against the crack at the bottom of the door. And now the, the gas had filled the room, and both of them didn't even realize they had been, been uh, they suffocated in, in, in the extent of that natural gas, and didn't even realize they were dying. And they were both dead when we got there. It seemed to us that there were several layers of evidence that we had to consider here that to me, it looked like somebody had set this up, right? I mean, you just start the gas the day before. You have a reason to kill her. All the things are usually in the open position or in the closed position, and you've got clothes stacked against one side of the wall heater and even stacked against the crack at the bottom of the door so you couldn't even allow gas to escape from the room. That, to me, that seemed like just too obvious, right? It's clear that somebody has tampered with this environment to cause that death. Does that make sense? So if you saw that as an investigator, you're going to go, okay, we've got to work this case. This is not an accident. This looks like it's been tampered with. Something similar has actually occurred in the universe. Because at both the foundational level, at the regional level, and at the locational level of our, our planet, things appear to be, have been tampered with, set up perfectly, not so that a death would occur, but so that life would occur. And at the foundational level of the universe, there are several factors called cosmological constants that have to be just so in order for life to emerge. As a matter of fact, if they're not just so, you, you can't even get the universe to be stable. And these conditions are on a razor's edge of fine-tuning. Let me give you an example of some of them in the universe. For example, did you realize that the, both the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force at the atomic level have to be extremely fine-tuned in order for matter to be stable? Even electromagnetism has to be incredibly fine-tuned. Even the forces of gravity, if they're in one direction of the tuning or the other direction of the tuning, either things will not coalesce or things will completely collapse. It turns out even the elements in the universe like carbon and helium have to be set to a certain level or life does not emerge. And it turns out this fine tuning is incredible and razor thin, razor sharpness. Just a fraction of it in one direction or a fraction in the other direction Life does not, the universe doesn't even hold together. Why is it this way? It's not just at that, at that foundational level. This is also true as you come in closer to the level of galaxies. At the regional level, you see that there's also fine-tuning. Our galaxy is incredibly fine-tuned. It's just the right shape. For life to emerge, it's far more likely to emerge in spiral galaxies. I'll show you why in a second. But it's not just that. It's that it's just in the right position in the universe, and it's just the right size. And our position inside this galaxy is also just right, not too close to the center where it's disruptive, but on a spiral arm outside where the mass is distributed enough that we could actually emerge as a planet, the right composition. Chemically, even the right planets are in our solar system. You realize that for a long time it's been debated 
But Jupiter and the large gas giants have a great role to play because they catch gravitational junk that's coming out into our, our system and they can divert it away from the inner planets. So a solar system that has large gas giants that are heavy gravity giants, those kinds of uh, bodies will help the inner planet survive asteroids, survive all kinds of space junk. Make sense? So all of this is just right. And if you get down to the level of our planet, well, then there's a number of things that are just right about our planet. I was noticing um, in Fox News two days ago, they were talking about how they discovered another planet they think might, might, might be hospitable for life. Really? Well, they, they have no idea, number one. And they have really underestimated the number of conditions that have to be just so. Yes, there's billions of planets in the universe, I'm sure of it. The problem is what's required for life is even more rare than the number of planets we have. The conditions have to be just so, and we happen to have them on our planet. Just the right conditions of our location related to the sun, the right tilt, the right atmospheric conditions, even the right terrestrial crust layer, not too thick, not too thin, and the presence of a moon which does great things for us. It slows down our rotation. It gives us seasons. It actually controls tides. These are things that you have to be in place for life to emerge on a planet. And that means that the number of planets that would actually fit this qualification is incredibly small. One. So if we go back to this analogy, look, I knew when I walked up to this scene that this was tampered with. I wasn't just going to walk away and say, oh, well, bad accident. I knew based on the conditions that this was no accident. Make sense? In a similar way, we have a condition here that we cannot just write off as an accident. We've got both a foundational level, a unique backstory. We have a regional level of the galaxies, which is hard to ignore. And finally, we have this locational level of all these tampered, all these little... Let me show you how crazy it is. I cannot collect and list for you all of the universal constants that have to be just so in order for us to be sitting here right now listening to this. But I can kind of illustrate it this way. If you were in a cockpit of a spaceship, okay, there are a number of things that have to be just so in order for you to get to the specific destination. These are all like the constants that we see in the universe that have to be finely tuned just so. All of these things have to be, if any one of these things is off by a degree in one direction or the other, you don't get to your destination. Now, you know, if you were to see a cockpit like this, you know that if you set this correctly so you can end up someplace really far away accurately, it's not an accident. It's that somebody has set all of these dials specifically to get you where you need to go. It's not an accident. And it turns out the universe is just like that. All of these these uh, coordinates have been set within a fraction to get us where we need to go, which is to a planet like ours, and more importantly, a planet in which life like ours can emerge. Does that make sense? This is why Paul Davies, who's not a believer, he's a, a physicist and a scientist at Arizona State University, he puts it this way, everyone agrees that the universe at least looks as if it has been designed for life. Everyone agrees on that. So how do you explain the appearance of fine-tuning? Well, it could just be there's a fine-tuner. Or you've got to explain it some other way. I want to show you before I show you all the explanations that people have offered, I want to show you how incredibly rare and how incredibly fine-tuned each constant is. I'll give you a couple of illustrations to, to illustrate this for you. Imagine that we were to take our North American continent, and we would stack so that there is not a single square inch anywhere on the continent that does not have a dime on it. In other words, we're going to get all kinds of dimes out, and we're going to put them all over the entire North American continent so that every dime is touching every other dime, and there's no spaces in between. Could you imagine how many dimes we're talking about? A lot of dimes. Now let's imagine that we begin stacking on each of those dimes. And we stack the dimes all the way, covering the entire North American continent, all the way to the moon. Okay? Sound good so far? It's not enough. Let's increase that by one billion times more. Now, you're getting an idea of how many dimes we have. That's a lot of dimes. Agreed? Now, imagine I was to blindfold you 
and tell you that there is one red dime in that stack. All I need you to do is to pick it. What are the odds that you would pick the one red dime? Well, these are the odds in numerical, this one in a 10 to the 37th chance. That is the same level of precision that is involved in the, um, the strong nuclear force that holds together. If you're off by just a, a dime in either direction, we don't get a universe that supports life. If you're off by a dime in either direction, do you see how finely tuned this force is? Let me put it another way. What if I said all you have to do is to get a 22 rifle and hit this bullseye? Now, the bullseye is one inch wide, and you, all you have to do is hit it. And I said, okay, that doesn't seem too hard, right? A lot of you are good shots here. You could probably hit that bullseye from wherever you are in the room. How many of you think no, no matter where you are in the room, you could hit that bullseye? Raise your hand. That's a lot of good shots. I'm going to get out of your way. <laughs> But what if I told you that the bullseye was actually at the opposite end of the observable universe? <laughs> One inch wide, opposite end of the observable universe. Now, if you hit it, this is pretty wild. As a matter of fact, the odds are not great. It's a one in 10 to the 60th chance. And that is exactly what the calibration is of the mass density of the universe. One inch off the target in either direction, and you don't have a universe like ours. Do you see how finely tuned this, this constant is? This is why a, a, theorist, a, a, a theoretical physicist you might know from television says it this way. It's shocking to find out how many of our familiar constants of the universe lie within a very narrow band that makes life possible. If a single one of these accidents, he calls them accidents, did you see what he calls them? If a single one of these accidents were altered, stars would never form, the universe would fly apart, DNA would not exist, life as we know it would be impossible, Earth would flip over and freeze, and so on. He's being serious. And he believes that this level of fine-tuning is purely an accident. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing to me how many thoughtful, smart people are willing to ignore the fine-tuning of the universe and say it's just an accident. Really? So if, 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 if Mickey Okaku was sitting at a poker table in Vegas, he's just sitting there playing cards, and the house deals his, you know, his friends, two of his friends, and they finally deal him, and they say, okay, and they deal themselves. And, and Mickey is sitting over here, and he's like, yeah, okay, cool. Looks at his cards, he's going, oh, gosh, I got a good hand here. I'm going to bet some money on this. And he bets everything he has or everything he can think of. He puts it all on the table. And then the house turns over their cards, and they've got a royal flush. Ugh, really? I thought I had a good hand. Now, in his mind, he, if he knew the odds of, of the house dealing themselves a royal flush from a single deck, that would be 10 to the 5.813, a 1 in 650,000 chance of dealing yourself a royal flush. That's why you should never play those, those uh, poker machines and hoping for the royal flush. Oh, I've got three of the, four, of the five cards, and you're going to actually hoping you get a 1 in 650,000 chance, really? So I can see, though, if he's playing cards here, and he might get frustrated and say, okay, well, and, I mean, it does happen, right? I mean, you, maybe you've seen it. That it's possible to get a royal, it's not that outrageous. Okay, so he stays in the game, and they deal a second hand. And now he looks at his second hand, and he goes, oh, my gosh, a straight flush. That's good, right? So what else can I, he puts his house on the line, okay? He mortgages his house, puts his bet, and sure enough, another royal flush. Really? What are the odds of somebody dealing themselves Two consecutive royal flushes with one, uh, really, you want know what they are? They're this. I think at this point, most reasonable people would say, nay, nay. <laughs> something's, not, something's not legit here. I'm, I'm out. But no, no, he's committed to his worldview, so he stays in. <laughs> and sure enough... The house deals three royal flushes. 
What are the odds of this happening? Pretty high. <laughs> Do you see our number so far? Well, that number, how does that relate to some of our universal constants? Let me show you the number, for example, of the strength of gravity, the calibration. I want you to see what this number is just so you have a sense. How many royal flushes would you have to deal in a row to approximate this number? A bunch. It turns out you would need six royal flushes in a row to get to the calibration for gravity, which is, now how many does it take to get to this calibration? This is the calibration necessary for quarks. Now, if you know anything about physics, I won't go into all the details, but these are the kind of, I've written it out here for you. The mass is associated with particles. This is really about the nucleus of the atom and how these hold together. You have to have a certain ratio of these. If it's too high or too low, you don't get atoms to form, <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. But how do I get to this number? That's a high number. How many royal flushes am I willing to sit through well, it turns out you would have to have 12 royal flushes to approximate that number in a row. What about the precision required to calibrate the energy density of space? That's 10 to the 90th power. That means you've got to sit at the table, and he takes that same deck of cards, and he deals himself not 12 in a row, but a bunch more in a row. So it seems to me, if, if Mickey Okako is so committed to his worldview that he refuses to believe that something is... Tan Are you really going to sit through that many royal... Before you'd say, get away from me, this is all a scam. There's no way you can deal that many... To deny that God, that somebody, something has fine-tuned the, the universe and the constants in the universe would be as stupid as sitting there and allowing somebody to deal themselves 28 royal flushes in a row and not get up from the table. Now, if, you, if this happened to you, you're gone. Two royal flushes in, you're gone, right? If it happens twice, you're out of there. Yet, these smart people would allow themselves to be dealt this 28 times and still say, yeah, this is the way it is. I guess I'm unlucky. <laughs> so there's a couple ways of you, you can explain the fine-tuning in the universe. Only a couple ways that I can think of that you can explain this fine-tuning. To, to stay inside the room especially. One is to say that it's just the result of chance. And people do say that. The other is to say, well, no, actually, there's something about the uh, physics involved that necessitates they end up this way. There is no other option. This is the way that physics works. The third is to say, well, look, if there are an infinite number of universes out there in the multiverse, why would you be surprised that one looks like ours? You could do this randomly, just, just roll out an infinite number of universes if that's the case. One is going to look like ours and support life. It's nothing about fine-tuning, it's about something else. Two of these explanations will keep you in the room. Of course, remember that the idea that we are part of a multiverse means that there's a multiverse generator outside our universe, outside the room, that is accountable for what's in the room. Make sense? So this one takes us out of the room. But these two you could actually have if you just said, look, the way physics are in the room and given chance, this is what happens. I want to examine these just quickly with you to see if these actually work. Let's go to our whiteboard for a second. The first is, is fine-tuning the result of just chance. Well, I want you to understand when someone says it's just chance, like sitting at that card table, why did he get 28? It's just chance. You realize that chance means that I don't really have an explanation. It just happened, right? So when someone uses the word chance, I don't want you to, start to think about it like it's some kind of explanation. It's not an explanation. If someone says chance is what caught, it just means I don't know the answer. It just happened. And I doubt you would be satisfied with that explanation from a scientist. And this is why that explanation is so unsatisfying to scientists. If you look at this, could you imagine? So I get there, right? And why do they call me to the scene? Well, dude, this is probably a homicide investigation. No, it's just a coincidence. It's just chance. It happens all the time. I could have walked away. How satisfying would that have been for the victim's family? I don't think so. 
They want me to actually figure out why it looks like it's been fine-tuned for death. This is what Davies says. I love Paul Davies. He says this in a book called The Goldilocks Enigma, Why is the Universe Just Right for Life? He says it this way. He says, how much chance, this is how much chance are you willing to put up with? How much can we buy in a scientific explanation? One measure of what is involved can be given in terms of coin flipping. The odds of 10 to 120. Now, remember, we did an illustration. We weren't even close to this number. Is like getting heads no fewer than 400 times in a row. If the existence of life in the universe is completely independent of, of big fix mechanism, and he believes, by the way, it is independent, but he says if it is, if it's just a coincidence, then those are the odds against our being here. That level of flukiness seems too much to swallow. Well, he's right. I don't think chance is a good answer, and either do they. So they're going to go someplace else with this. One uh, op uh, option that's been offered is that, look, it's just a matter of necessity. The, the universe is fine-tuned this way because there's no other way for physics to work. Now, imagine back at our scene here for a second. I know this is an important scene to look at because it doesn't have to be this way. If that was the case, every house would be this way. <laughs> I actually investigate this crime because I know that it could have been different. And that's why it's important for me to investigate it. Well, when it comes to the universe, the question is, could it have been different? Because if it can't be different, there's no point in investigating it. If the physics are such that it has to be this way, there's no point in investigating it. The problem is that we, all the physicists who look at this, know that that isn't the case. I wonder what Paul Davies has to say about this. Let's find out. Here he is. There's not a shred of evidence that the universe is logically necessary. Indeed, there's a theoretical physicist, as a theoretical physicist, I find it rather easy to imagine alternative universes that are logically consistent and therefore equal contenders of reality. He's not alone in that regard. Most physicists would say, well, no, that you could have a different set of constants. So then, how, okay, if that's the case, if it's not chance and it doesn't have to be this way, it just happens to be this way, how do I get around the appearance of fine-tuning? Well, I think the most popular answer, and I think it's an answer actually that is driven by this fine-tuning problem, is the idea of a multiverse, okay? The idea of a multiverse. Because here what we're saying basically is, this is a chance, if you have enough chances, you can overcome the odds. You, know, you remember we talked last night about Lawrence Krauss? I, I love his work because I think he's kind, of, he's kind of cocky, and he's kind of funny at times, and he's kind of a goofball. But he wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing, and here's one of the things that he kind of argues. He says, well, look, the, why are you even asking this stupid question about fine-tuning? Like, duh. This is just the way it is because we happen to be in a universe that allows us to look at it and ask the question to begin with. In other words, he says it this way. Put it another way, it's not surprising to find that we live in a universe in which we can live. You catching it? He's saying this is an observational phenomena. You know, this doesn't require anything extravagant. Look, it just happens to be this way. And because it happens to be this way, you evolve to a place where you can observe it and say, wow, I wonder why it happens to be this way. Well, if it didn't happen to be this way, you wouldn't be here to observe it. So he says, look, why is it so surprising to find that it's fine-tuned? If it wasn't fine-tuned, you wouldn't be here to find it surprising. Do you follow me on it now? And believe it or not, people look at this and go, yeah. They'll say, yeah, you're right. It's just an observational phenomenon. It's just the fact that you can observe it does not mean it's, it's anything to be curious about. Really? Okay, let's go back to our crime scene for a second. Could you imagine if I arrive at the crime scene and I go, I'm not working this. Why do you think it's so surprising to find this the way it is? I mean, think about it. To put it another way, it's not surprising to find a dead body in a house which, in which there exists a dead body. Let me put it a different way. We shouldn't be surprised, okay, to find dead bodies in a house with the windows and doors suspiciously closed and the vents and the gas lines found as they were. If the conditions weren't like this, no one would have died and we wouldn't have been called to the scene.
Does that sound satisfying to you? No. Detectives know that there's a difference between an observation and an explanation. Yes, I can observe these conditions, and they happen to be this way. But that does not explain why they're this way. That's my job, is to explain why they were this way. The same is true for scientists who are looking at the universe. Their job is to not just to confuse the fact that these things are the way they are. No, we need an explanation for why they are that way. Well, Mickey Kaku would say, well, it's because you have a multiverse. Here's why this is the way it is. If you have enough chances, if you bang out enough universes, eventually one is going to look like this. That's all there is to it. As a matter of fact, I actually think that that is the tail that wags the dog on multiverse theory. I think that people want to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. It's such a problem, and no other explanation is working. So now they're saying, okay, if there are enough chances to get this universe, then eventually you're going to get this universe. I can overcome the crazy long odds against dealing 208 or 28 uh, straight of you know, royal flushes if I just have enough chances. He puts it this way. In this multiverse of universes, most universes are dead. The proton is not stable. Atoms never condense. DNA never forms. The universe collapses prematurely or freezes almost immediately. But in our universe, a series of cosmic accidents has happened, not necessarily because of the hand of God, but because of the law of averages. In other words, I told you last night about this idea of this pot of boiling water, this quantum environment in which particles emerge for no reason and then grow into the size of universes. If the pot is filled and is also growing and has been doing that since all eternity, that means we've got a lot of universes in that pot. Make sense? Now, the question is, why would you believe there is a pot? Why would you believe this is actually happening? What is the evidence to support this claim? There is not a lot of evidence to support this claim. It's all kind of speculation, and it's metaphysical conjectures. As a matter of fact, Paul Davies, I wonder what Paul Davies says about this. (laughs) Paul Davies says, prominent scientists and commentators have used words such as fantasy, virus, and intellectually bankrupt on their denunciations. For these theoretical physicists hard at work trying to formulate a unique final theory, the multiverse comes across as a cheap way out. Randomness plus observer selection, again, the fact we happen to be observing in a universe we happen to be in, strikes many physicists as an ugly and impoverished explanation compared with an overarching mathematical theory that pins down the properties of the world with quantitative precision and interweaves them into harmonious unity. In other words, Paul's not a fan of multiverse, okay? Because he thinks there's not enough evidence to support it. But it would explain why we happen to be in a universe that appears to be fine-tuned. It's because, well, how many of these universes do we have to begin with? How many of these things are there in the set of multiverses? Well, there's no reason to believe there's anything less than an infinite number. Why would you say, well, there's 537? (laughs) Okay, how do you get to that number? Well, no, the idea here is that you're in an infinitely old, eternal, quantum environment that produces universes. So how many are there going to be? It's going to be infinite. Really? Now, of course, if you had an infinite number of universes, one's going to look like ours. But therein lies the problem. Think about this for a second. If I've got an infinite collection of universes here, and let's say just some small, small, small percentage looks like ours, Say point zero 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 one percent. How many universes look like ours? An infinite number. Because any fraction of an infinite gives you what? An infinite. This is the problem with infinites. So what how many universes kind of look like ours? 
with our universal constants? An infinite number. Okay, if that same percentage of the universes that look like ours actually have humans, it'd be a small number, that have humans that have formed nations with the same names as ours. That'd be a small, 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 small percentage, but it's of an infinite. So how many are there? Oh. Of those, if there's a small, small, small percentage that not only have our names as nations, but have the exact same populations, and all of the people in those populations have all the same names as you and me, how many are there? An infinite. And if, if those, there's a small, small fraction in which they are meeting on a Saturday in a building just like this in a town called, you know, it's exactly the same as us, listening to a guy saying the exact same words, how many of those universes are there? Oh, they're an infinite. <laughs> and then, of those, if there's a small percentage in which everything's the same except that the guy named J. Warner Wallace is wearing a red shirt instead of a blue shirt, how many of those are there? Do you see the problem with this thinking? Well, so do the scientists. So Alan Guth is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. He says, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. If there's a multiverse, as you suggest, that could provide this kind of fine-tuning, then you've got an infinite number of universes like ours, and an infinite number in which we're exactly the same, and an infinite number in which we're all the same, except we're in different shirt colors. That means if the multiverse is true, he says, there's a universe where Elvis is still alive. Now do you see how absurd this explanation is? So when I talk about multiverses, I'm just like, the first question I'm going to ask anyone who proposes we're in a multiverse is, how many universes do you think are in the multiverse? If, there's got, if they say anything less than an infinite, I want to know, why would you think there's anything less than an infinite? And once they bite and say, well, there's an infinite number, they're toast. <laughs> if there's an infinite number of universes with all kinds of different conditions, isn't it then reasonable that one of them would be governed by a god? You see where your infinites lead you? They lead you to all kinds of things. You'd have to at least say, well, maybe this is the universe in which God exists. Now, I grant you that's a stupid approach, but my point is, <laughs> do you see where that kind of thinking takes you? Okay. So if we're going to stay inside the room and not go outside of the room, we've got a couple of choices. It's either chance or law chance or necessity. We know it's not chance because you have to ignore the long odds to get to that. You have to be, a, I don't think many people would say it's chance, but they will say it's necessitated, but there's no evidence to suggest that. And then you have to ignore all the fine tuning. Now you could say it's just a result of the multiverse, but if you did that, you're jumping outside the room because the multiverse generator is not part of the universe. It creates the universe. It's the intruder that's not a personal intruder. It's an impersonal force that causes the universe. So you already have to have an external cause. The problem is, what does that thing look like? And we're suggesting that somehow it lacks all spatial, temporal, and material conditions, right? Because it cannot, those things did not begin to exist until our universe began to exist. So whatever caused our universe to exist cannot itself be spatial, temporal, or material. Yet all of these environments are exactly that. They're all going to have to be spatial, temporal, and material. That's the problem with this. Also, I think you could argue, if there was a universe generator out here that had the ability to produce an infinite number, well, wouldn't that thing also have to be fine-tuned? As a matter of fact, Richard Swinburne, the uh, philosopher and professor at Oxford, says it this way, any proposed multiverse mechanism needs to have certain form rather than innumerable possible other forms. And probably constants, too, that need fine-tuning in the narrow sense. You're not going to escape the need for a fine-tuner by suggesting there's a multiverse, because then the multiverse generator is the thing you're looking at the fine-tuning for. Got it? You're stuck with fine-tuning, and you're stuck with the universe that came into existence for nothing. Now, of course, if there is an all-powerful, purposeful, goal-oriented personal deity outside the universe that can fine-tune, in other words, a cosmic, divine, fine-tuner, that would explain all the stuff we see in the room, wouldn't it? 
And that's why I think this is, again, the best explanation from evidence. Now, I, I, we talked about this because we've been talking about the intruders, right? This whole, really, what I taught you with this skill set, this inside or outside of the room, this is really just about intruder investigations. I often will ask myself, why is it that when I, to me, it was so overwhelmingly obvious that there were eight, I mean, especially, we didn't even talk about biology. I would love to be able to cover that with you. But just DNA, just the origin of life in the universe from non-life, the appearance of, bio, of, of, of design and biology, to me, it's overwhelming. Even to Antony Flew, the, the, the skeptic, the probably most renowned atheist of the 20th century, he was a colleague of C.S. Lewis, he remained a skeptic until the discovery of DNA. And when he saw that, he said, okay, he at least became a deist. He said, there's, there's got to be a God. He didn't become a Christian. But he said, I cannot believe there's no God, given the fine-tuning and the information in DNA. So I wonder, why is it that people don't accept the evidence for God's existence? It's right here. In the end, what we're suggesting is that there is a divine intruder, and no one likes intruders. No one. That's why I think people resist the existence of God, because God ultimately intrudes on our lives. But would you really be fair in calling God an intruder? <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. I don't know. We had a case one time where um, a neighbor looked over her back wall and saw someone she didn't recognize in her neighbor's backyard come through the side fence, go to the back door, try to open the back door. It wouldn't open. It was locked. So this person she didn't recognize kicked the back door of her neighbor's house in and went inside the house. So she called the police. She said, there's a, it's a guy on my neighbor's house across the backyard wall who just kicked the door, so we called the house. We had a premise file that has the numbers of all the uh, different locations. We called this. This is back when people actually had phones that weren't look, didn't look like this. They actually had, get this, guy. believe it or not, we used to have phones you would plug into the wall. <laughs> That's right. You couldn't take them with you. Unplug them. You're like, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so we called the house line, and, and sure enough, no one picks up the phone. But the neighbor says, I can see movement in there. So we, we have a, a rapid deployment team. It's kind of like a SWAT team. It's like a rapid deployment team. The guys who are on duty, they have extra gear in their cars. They put their gear on. They rush to the house. They're getting ready to knock, you know, see who this intru- to basically arrest what they think is a burglar. Of course, as they're getting ready to kick the door in, the door opens. And a guy standing there, dripping wet, says, what you, what, what's up? Well, you're a neighbor called. But she said, well, I've never met my neighbor. I don't know my neighbor, but, but I locked myself out of my house, so I was frustrated. I, got, I, I forced my way in, and I'm just taking a shower. Turns out he lived there. <laughs> the, the neighbor had never met her, her neighbor on the other side, so didn't recognize him as he got in his own house. <laughs> now, why did she call us? Because she thought that, that we had an intruder, okay? She thought that the house was being burglarized, okay? No, we didn't have an intruder. He lives there. We had instead an inhabitant who is the owner. Isn't that what we have in the universe? We can't call him an intruder. This is his house. If anyone's an intruder here, it's us. Only we were created for this environment. But we could never say, well, God's intruding on my life because he's stepping into the universe with me. Really, it's his house. He's just invited us to come along. So this is not really about an intruder we should resist. It's about an owner we should embrace. So in the end, as I looked at these eight pieces, I do think that the best explanation for these eight, I don't think you can get those eight things from inside the room. I think the best explanation for those is outside the room. Some good ones. Uh, All right. So someone asks, um, how do we know that it's possible to not possible to have a different set of constants necessary for life. You see on Earth, um, you know, life on Earth has adapted to the, mm -hmm. the conditions that it has, uh, water okay. life, uh, right. land life. How, how could, what if uh, constants had changed a little bit so that life 
would adapt to those. Right, so that's, that's a question that's been asked. Actually, there's an article at, on Forbes magazine about a week ago and talking about, well, maybe we were just wrong about the narrowness of these constants. Maybe we just don't know how much more flexibility we could have and still arrive at the same location. Well, that may be true of the locational constants, but it's not true of the foundational constants because we know that small changes in weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, those kinds of things would not even allow a universe to sustain itself so that life could emerge. When people say, well, maybe there, there's more flexibility, what they're really talking about are the uh, conditions of planet Earth, of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So we already know that the fine-tuning of the foundational constants of physics, you're not going to be able to get away from that. But you could argue, well, look, how do we know that if the, if the Earth's crust was just a, a, you know, half a mile thicker or the moon was a little bit smaller or a little bit further away, how do we know that life wouldn't still emerge? Okay, fine. Uh, you'll notice that my card dealing here had nothing to do with the conditions of the Earth. They were all just about the foundational conditions of physics in general at the foundational level that are preposterously large. So even if you were to say, well, I could fudge with this a little bit locationally here on Earth, you still got a problem in terms of the location of the galaxy and, location and the conditions of the universe. Which is why, by the way, it's not as though I'm the only one, it's not as though I'm saying to you, as a Christian, I think the universe is fine-tuned or appears to be. No, everyone thinks that. Everyone thinks, even the atheist thinks there appears to be fine-tuning. He, he doesn't think it is fine-tuned. And that's why we have theories like multiverse theory. Because they see the same problem I see. The only difference is an explanation. Make sense? Let me show you what else they'll do sometimes. Sometimes they'll say this. They'll say, is it even necessary at all? Maybe the conditions like you're talking about for life are much broader. Or maybe you have a too narrow vision of what you call life. So Victor Stinger is now gone. He's, he died a couple of years ago. But he wrote a book called The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. And here's what he said. To defeat the fine-tuning argument, I do not have to give a reason why each parameter has the value it does. I must only show that life could be plausible under a wide range of parameters. And that's kind of what you're asking here. Really? So, Victor, what would you call life? Remember I told you that one of the things that the defense attorneys will do is try to redefine terms? Here what he's trying to say is, I can redefine this word, uh, life, so that the parameters could be changed. I'm talking about organisms that can ingest, can metabolize, and can reproduce. Those are the very smallest conditions of things we would say, you're a living organism if you can do these things. That's pretty minimal, right? So here's what he says about life. He says, well, that's, he, just, he rejects this view of life because he knows that if he moves the parameters just a little bit, you won't get this. You won't get this at all. He knows that. So he redefines the word life. He says it this way. He says, in my view, life is a property that any sufficiently complex, non-linear, interacting, dissipative system will develop in a sufficiently long time. So I ignore, I will ignore those parameters that constrain life to our biology and our biology alone. He's redefined what life is. Any complex, nonlinear, interacting, dissipative system, I'm not sure what you mean by dissipative, would a computer qualify then? Would a robot qualify? I mean, we could change the definitions and then say, well, the parameters can change. That's one way to do it. Can you imagine if I did that back at the crime scene? I said, you know, I'm just going to go, you want me to investigate this gas smell and, and these... Mo what am I here to investigate? I'm here to investigate this, right? If it was just the injury of a person, I wouldn't have to be called to the scene. It's the, I have to have a strong definition of what death is. So what they're doing is saying, hey, what are you here to do in this environment? Are you here just to explain any version of life you can think up? Or are you here to explain the version of life that's sitting in the room right now waiting for an explanation? So I don't think you can redefine it. And what they'll typically do, he, he's, he's got some imaginary form of life. Well, what is that? So I think when you're stuck with these parameters 
Um, and then again, remember that all I'm talking about are the parameters of the universe. You're going to have a hard time getting around those. If you wanted to argue, well, the earth could be a little bit bigger in mass, okay, fine. Remember, and it's, it, the mass of the earth alone is not going to solve your problem. It's that combination of mass, gravitational pull, distance from the sun in that Goldilocks zone, the thickness of the atmosphere, how much it allows oxygen and carbon-based life. To, it's a ton of these things that all have to be in place simultaneously before anything emerges, which is why there's a thing called the Fermi paradox. I think he was an astrophysicist who simply asked this question. Look, if the universe is infinitely old or it's really, really, really old and there's this many life forms out there, why haven't they found us yet? He's asking this of other atheist cosmologists and it's become called, now it's called the Fermi paradox. Why haven't they? Well, a guy named Drake wrote an equation in which he's got like seven things that have to happen in order for us to encounter intelligent life in the universe. And if you look at those seven things, there's a good reason to believe that there is no other intelligent life in the universe. Although people ask me all the time, what if there was? Would that change the Christian story? What if there's a planet out there where like Romulans are living, right? (laughs) And Klingons are on another planet, right? Right? Well, if you go to those planets, if those actually existed, I suspect when you get there, they're going to tell you a story about God coming to them in human form and dying to save them. Would that change your belief? If there's there's other life out here that God has... Look, He's clearly not just designed us. There's other biological life here on the planet with us. But He's got a special role for us. And that's not going to change if I find microbes on Mars. Hmm. It's not. It has no impact on my Christian worldview. It has no impact on the Christian story. Some, there were several questions about uh, how, how these uh, statistics are arrived at, the pretty, pretty uh, phenomenal statistics, 10 right. to the billionth power or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, how those numbers are arrived billion. at. Yeah. And, the, you, know, um, w- you know, one question, it seems like, the things that do happen, a lot of things that handom, happen randomly are... Let me look at my PowerPoint for an answer on this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Keep asking your question. No. Ask your silly it. question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, what... Uh, the fact that you and I are here on the stage on this date where... Yes. It's, uh, in one sense, it's random. It's, it wasn't planned out. Um, the odds are phenomenal, though, that it occurred exactly mm-hmm. this way. Yes. Explain. Okay, so <laughs> you got some explaining to do. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, how do we get these numbers? Let's just talk about that for the first part of it. These are not numbers that were arrived at by Christian theologians or Christian apologists. These are the numbers, the statistical rarity that's been arrived at by those guys. This is, these are the numbers that they're giving us, that the astrophysicists are giving us. And I'm willing to use their data. I think it's actually even more powerful when we use their data because I'm not creating those numbers. And that's the problem. That's why they've got multiverse theories. They look at their data and they go, oh my gosh, we got a problem here. Um, I wanted to show you this because I think it kind of addresses this issue, and that's that there is a difference between a fact and an inference. So what I try to do is separate these two things. People will say all the time, well, the multiverse is a fact, or evolution is a fact, or whatever their claim is, is a fact. No, it's an inference from facts. I get it. Facts are those pieces of evidence that we show a jury. But It's a fact that he's guilty? No, it's a fact that these things happened. I can infer now that he's guilty. The facts lead me to an inference. Now, I wish it was just the rules of evidence that we all use to get from here to here, but it's not always the case. A lot of what helps people decide whether the facts lead to an inference has nothing to do with evidence at all. It has to do with, unfortunately, the way they were wired or their their memories, their own historical past shapes the way they view things, or what their preferences are, or what their desires are. These are things that people, unfortunately, allow them to shape the facts into an inference. And so you can end up with two people who look at the same two sets of facts, same set of facts, and come to two entirely different uh, conclusions. Well, why? 
because they've allowed their personal experiences, preferences, and desires to shape their decision. It's this stuff here. It's like we start off in a car, go into the same destiny, you know, one of three possible destinations, and we end up in one of those three destinations. Well, why? What, what, we started off together. Why do we end up in different places? That stuff. That stuff is what drives us. Now, so when I see somebody who looks at a multiverse or looks at evidence in the universe, let's say, and they come to a certain conclusion, like my friends, for example, who look at evidence, and they say, I believe based on the evidence that Darwinism is true, they'll say Darwinism is a fact. No, even if it's true, it's not a fact in that way. The facts are the evidences that lead you to this inference. It might be a true inference, but it turns out when I look at my, I'm looking at the exact same set of evidences. I'm not making up Christian facts to get to a Christian inference. I'm looking at the same biological facts that they are in DNA, in biology. And I think that it points to the exact opposite direction. I think that this is the best inference, design is the best inference for the same facts that they say Darwinism is the best inference. Well, why do we end up in two different places here? Mm. Sometimes it's this stuff. So I think what's happening here with, with, uh, with the multiverse is that people, I'm looking, those numbers are not my numbers. Those are their numbers. I think the best inference is our inference. Now, look, I know we... we how much time do we have for Q&A? Ten more minutes. Okay, I want to just answer a question that came up on the stage yesterday. Maybe it's on your list, I don't know. This idea, well, if we're saying that God created everything, who created God? Who created God? How many of you have heard that kind of claim or wondered that yourself? That's why I knew I wanted to answer it. So a couple things about that that strike me as interesting. The first is, as Christians, we believe in the law of causality. As scientists, they believe in the law of causality, which says that anything that has a beginning has a cause. Anything that changes, like its position in the room, has a cause, which is causing the change. Follow me? The law of causation requires a couple of things that if they exist, you know you have a cause. But we don't believe that God began to exist. He's always existed. So he doesn't need a cause based on the cause of law. We don't believe that God changes. And this is why we don't believe he needs a cause. In other words, our definition of God as Christians is that God is the uncreated creator. So if you're going to ask, well, then who created the uncreated creator? Uh, well, duh, that's in the definition. <laughs> right? Who created the uncreated? He's uncreated. That's the part of his definition. But if it makes you feel any better, everyone believes in an uncreated creator. These people who posit the multiverse do not believe the multiverse came into existence. They believe that that multiverse generator is eternal. It's uncreated. So when someone asks me, well, who created your God? Well, who created your multiverse generator? Where's this conversation going? We both believe that there is some cause of the universe that is itself uncreated. We both agree on that, right? Well, yeah. The only difference is I believe that that creator, that uncaused first cause is personal. And you believe the uncaused first cause is impersonal set of physics in a quantum environment called a multiverse generator. So we both believe. We're both looking for the same thing, guys. That question, who created your God? Well, okay, who created whatever you think caused the universe? We all have to answer that question. Now, it turns out that if there is, what would make God God is his eternal nature. <laughs> it's one of the things that makes him God. Make sense? So I don't think that question really, to me, it's a, it's a conversation stopper. We need to move past it to talk about, well, yeah, we all agree there's something out there that's uncreated. Now, the question is, what is it? That's all that's left to talk about. Some are wondering, so what are, what are the responses? Like, these seem so compelling, your arguments. Someone wrote in, it seems like it takes more faith to believe in the multiverse than others. What, what do you think is going on there? Why is there pushback against... The well, I think there are three reasons why people shun the truth. Mm. And when I say shun, you guys even use that word anymore? Um, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. The, the first one is rational. See how I cheated on that? So people will say, I don't think there's enough evidence for this, and they have a rational objection. 
And if that's the case, well, we'll talk about the evidence. But, that, but people will say they have a rational objection when they really don't. They have an objection in one of the other two categories. The second category is emotional. Got it? Emotional objections. Uh, my dad was a Christian, and he was a jerk. And I've known a lot of Christians. They are jerks. They're so, such hypocrites. Okay, well, it doesn't sound like you even know what the evidence is for this or isn't. You don't really care. You just don't like the people you know who are Christians. That's an emotional response. That's not about evidence. So I could spend a lot of time talking about the evidence, but if your objections are emotional, I'm not sure how far that's going to go, no. right? The third category, I think, is the biggest category. And it really isn't a matter of rational or emotional objections. They are volitional objections. I don't want it to be true because I like my life the way it is right now. And I'll say, nothing's broken. Why well, don't I need to fix it? And, and that was me for a lot of years. That's my dad today, is that he doesn't have a bad experience with Christians. He's had nothing but good experience with Christians. But he doesn't want to change his life. And, you know, the, the difference between us as Christians and our friends who are not believers, don't believe in God, is that they are really their own God. Is that if you get to decide freely what is right and wrong, I mean, it's really hard to be a hypocrite when I hold to my private standard that is personal. Because you wouldn't even know if I'm violating my standard, right? And it's a private, personal standard. For all you know, this is how I think the world should be. You and I, though, are going to be called hypocrites before anybody else because we don't just hold to our private, personal standard, which could change day to day. We hold to an unchanging, eternal, public standard that they all know. So when you mess up, they all know you mess up because they know the standard that you claim to follow, it's public, and it doesn't change. So who's going to be called a hypocrite first? Us, of course. Anyone who holds to the unchanging public standard, they're going to be called the hypocrite first. So just get, be ready for that. That's, of course, what's going to happen, right? And, and, and that's a lot of the reason why I think I resisted for so many years. It is easier to hold to my private changing standard. Nobody's going to, how are you doing today, Jim? Great. How do I know? Just ask me. <laughs> I'm the standard. And I have not violated my personal standards. I have personal standards on this issue. I do not violate my personal standard. What does that tell you? Zero. Because you don't know what my personal standards are, and I could change those tomorrow. They would still be my personal standards. Follow me? And that's where I think a lot of people are, is that you want me to abandon something that is driving culture today. It's one word. It's called autonomy. As we are in a culture that wants autonomy. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to think. Don't tell me who I am. I'll tell you who I am. I want complete autonomy. Make sense? Yet we are, if we're Christians, we're going to have to surrender our autonomy to the Word of God. And then that's a much bigger ask, I think. So I would find ways to, to maneuver around the evidence because I wanted to hold on to my autonomy. Someone asked about, you know, they, they brought up that this is a ton of research, you know, yeah. and they're wondering where to start if they're sharing their faith with someone with apologetics. You yeah. know, you're, you're highlighting the importance of apologetics, but it takes a ton of uh, scientific knowledge. There's logic involved. Where do we, where do we start? Uh, not just studying it, but presenting this information. So, yeah, that's, that's a tough question, right? Because... Well, what I'm suggesting... No PowerPoint for that one? Yeah, no, actually... <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> Give me a second. And I, of course, I will have them. something to show you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me... Um, while I'm, I'm talk awkwardly amongst yourselves while I, I scan through my PowerPoint here. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. I think it's right. I think it's right here, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. 
Are you apologizing to the audience? They, they're like going, oh, gosh, I can't wait to see more of Jim's PowerPoint. You better be saying that anyway. Um, so I think here's, here's what I would, I would say about it. Yes, the, the, the version of Christianity that I'm suggesting we need to engage in is a much more labor-intensive version. I'll just be honest with you. It is. It seems to me that if anyone's capable of doing it, though, it's your group. Because what I'm seeing in this group, and I think this is, you know, so I, I, was, I got saved in a huge church. Uh, and you may have feelings about Saddleback Church in California. I mean, you've heard it, I'm sure, Rick Warren's church. And I was there for three years on staff, and then I, I went from there to a church of about 250. And at the end of that time, I, I planted a church, which was a house church. So it's very similar to what you guys do. And it was a church of about 50. I took my garage and blew it out. And every time we got to 60, we just planted another church. Probably the same kind of model you guys do, right? Similar. So, sounds similar. So, so I would do that every, um, every uh, probably about every two months. It would get to 60 again, and we'd have to plant something. So it was crazy, right? Like mine. And, and, that, and I will tell you, oh, thank you. I don't know why you're applauding, but okay. Uh, I can't even find my PowerPoint, dang it. Uh, yeah. I can't answer the question. Uh, so we, we would do this, and I felt like uh, in that setting, we were pretty committed because our, probably like your meetings, right? We would meet at 5 o'clock. Um, we, for, we were sharing a church. When I planted this church, we were sharing a church uh, with another facility in Southern California. So we only had availability to the church on Saturday nights because they were having church services on Sunday, and we couldn't afford our own church. When we finally merged with another church, I planted the house group, and so we were already meeting on Saturday night. So I said, let's just leave it that way because my group was all college-age students. So I said, okay, we're just going to meet on Saturday nights. And we would start at 5 o'clock, and we would be there for three, four hours every Saturday night. Then we would go to dinner and close a restaurant down by around 10. So we'd ask for five hours of weekly commitment, which to you guys sounds like nothing, right? Because you're already <laughs> committing hours. But, you know, for most Christians, we're not committing five hours a week to a church meeting. We're just not. So if anyone can do this, it's your group. But I think what you do is you start small. So there's eight pieces of evidence we talked about here. Uh, not all eight of those are interesting to you guys. Some of those are like, eh, it's, it's cool, but not my thing. But there's one or two of those you go, yeah, actually, I, I can see that. I like that one. Okay, well, that's the one you're going to master. You're going to start small and master something that you already like because I've got a background in biology. Somebody came up last night, and she was like, yeah, I have a background in biology, so this resonates. Well, that biology piece, she should be able to master because she, that's what, and when God's gifted each of you in some different way to master some small piece of the case. And when you talk to your friends, you're always going to go to your, your money car. You know, that's going to be your, you know that topic. And that's where you're going to go. Now, for a lot of you, you're like, well, yeah, but I haven't really mastered anything yet. Really? Why? Why haven't you? You people in this room, I'll bet you you're all Cavalier fans, aren't you? <laughs> really? I hope you enjoyed that last hurrah, okay? <laughs> Rubbing it in. Now that, now that LeBron <laughs> has been torn off the side of the building <laughs> and is living in Brentwood, I'm not a Lakers fan, okay, but I'm just saying, the reason why I asked that question is because I'll bet you, you don't only know that last year's history with the Cavaliers, you probably know five years of history of the Cavaliers. You probably remember when he was in Miami. You probably remember who was on the team when he was in my... Really? Some of you know who was playing on the Cavaliers while LeBron was in Miami. You know who was coaching. You know how those people got hired and where those players came from and where they went when they reformulated the team and where they're going to be. You actually already know the start or pretty close the starting lineup for next year. Really? You're using up a lot of gray matter for that. <laughs> so my suggestion is, and I, by the way, I do the same thing. But my suggestion is it's about reprioritizing. It's about you saying, well, you love something so much that you could have a two-hour conversation with a buddy about that topic. Do you love this that much? That you are ready to have a two-hour conversation with somebody who's not a believer? And are you able to have a two-hour conversation without having to go to your holy book? Because if you were going to be talking to me, the minute you went to your holy book, the conversation would end. You're going to have to get me there a different way. Now, it turns out your holy book 
accurately describes the world the way it really is, but you couldn't start there with me. You'd have to master the other stuff first to get me to pay attention. Because I would think, well, if you're a Christian and you believe all of that, well, I agree with you on that stuff. Let me see your holy book. Now I can look at it. So my question is, are you that interested in this to exchange your interest in the Cavaliers? <laughs> 